Hello and welcome back to Cooking the Books with me, Jilly Smith, for a special series celebrating the Andre Simon Awards 2021. Each week until the awards themselves on March the 8th, we're celebrating the authors shortlisted for the prestigious Food Book Gong with an introduction by food assessor, the Nigerian-born author Yemisi Arabisala. Now, four out of seven on the shortlist have already appeared on Cooking the Books, and this week you'll get a chance to listen again to Rachel Roddy on her shortlisted book, The A to Z of Pasta. The sort of 50 shapes were sort of, yes, 50, 50 sort of insights, 50 details put together to have a picture of Italy and of pasta. But first, Yemisi told me what makes Rachel one of the best food writers of 2021. I, I think Rachel Roddy was always a guaranteed success because the thing about Roddy is that she just rolls up her sleeves and she does the work. I've always been in love with Roddy's life story. You know, the headstrong migration to Rome and the commitment to this community that you chose with fire licking your heels. She didn't enter as British expatriate, but as Italian food lover, migrant, lover and mother. And there's just Roddy's natural good heartedness that comes through with such purity whenever you read her. It helps you instinctively trust her food and agree to eat it. Um, As regards her book, rationales are important, you know, and often a difficult way to enter culture because you have to be open and you have to agree to be bombarded. Uh, There are no summaries in Roddy's book. There are no glib summaries. And then you have to have the intelligence to diplomatically go through the information you gather without offending the indigents. Then you have to be brutal in leaving out and recording what has value. And Roddy's book presents this process as an easy premise. You know, even the title of her book uh, promotes that ease. Her voice is as clear as a glass of water. As you progress through the pages, you realize the incredible amount of legwork and brainwork and everything else that has gone into the book. You also see the landscape that she's walking and eating through in vivid colors and you meet people and learn their histories. Then you sit in front of a plate that finally makes sense, but doesn't diminish in any way whatsoever the final product analysis. And this is what I mean by Roddy's hard no faffing around work. So an A to Z of pasta is incredibly competent. It takes you into context beautifully. Its pace is brisk. It is full of lovely stories and is excellent as all of Roddy's work is. Rachel Roddy is the Guardian Italian food columnist and already a multi-award winning author. She's been in Rome for 16 years now and although she has a Sicilian partner and a nine-year-old child, she's a professional observer of Italian life. I started by asking her if she always felt a little on the outside looking in. Oh, ab- absolutely. You know, I mean, one's always a barrier is, is my Italian, which is fine. I mean, it should be much better for 16 years and um, and still feel frustrated by my communication. So I think that that is a sort of constant barrier for me um, and also can sort of work in an advantageous way in the sense that, and this is going to sound sort of so corny, but, you know, certainly around cooking, sometimes, you know, language and words can get in the way. I think early, early on when I was sort of cooking with people and really couldn't understand, there was a different maybe level of understanding. Um, and I think still that exists. Um, also, I'm, I have a tendency to talk too much. It doesn't stop me talking, in, in it, especially when I'm nervous. So actually, often with Italian, I will, it's a sort of, it forces me just to say, actually, I can't communicate this in the way I'd like to. So, um, yeah, that keeps me outside. And I have a nine-year-old child who is half Italian. So, and that whole world of school, actually, and that le- different level of engagement with the country um, that I haven't found straightforward has also made me feel a- an outsider. Although I feel very sort of integrated, I feel incredibly local. I mean, I always have. I think, you know, as humans, we're quite good at making ourselves feel local. And Italy's, um, as well as lots of other countries, but I only know Italy, is quite good I- I- in the sense that you can feel local, go back to the same shop twice and you, you know, you feel... So I, I think I've felt local since the first day I was here. Um, my sort of feelings of otherness have, you know, shift and, shift and change depending on, on um, what's happening in life. And you use the ingredients to tell stories. With your Guardian column, there are always little tales of things that you've noticed. Is that how it works for you? You go down to the market at Testaccio and you're, you're, you, know, you notice something and you, you write about it or you go in through an ingredient but tell a story. Is, you're constantly on watch. 
Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I suppose, you know, around, is it, around the sort of storytelling, I, I, you know, as a writer, as you know, as I, I'm quite self-critical. Um, and, you know, I've got these sort of two voices on my shoulder, sort of, what the fuck are you going on about, woman? No one wants to hear about you and your, you know. But actually, I do think, you know, stories are the best way in, aren't they? I mean, what, you know, I, I do tell a story about, you know, I don't know, um, a pot of yoghurt falling on the floor or, 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 you know, a sort of interaction with somebody or a, or a sort of particularly comic carrot. Um, but um, but they're sort of nice ways, aren't they? To sort of, as a reader, I've always known it's the sort of it's the sort of show don't tell. I'm going to sound like sort of GCSE creative writing, but it is true, isn't it? And I and I, I sort of remind remind it all the time, you know, why why the sort of story is the best way in um, to sort of understanding something. And it, it so often is, isn't it? You know, what do we remember? Yesterday I was trying to sort of write about a restaurant, and, and I was trying to be all lofty, and I was trying to be a restaurant review, reviewer, which I'm not, and not very good at. But you know, I, I haven't been out to eat, and I went to this restaurant, and you know when you you're excited to go out and you get goosebumps as you go in the door. The sort of thrill of going in a restaurant, isn't it? You know, you really... And it was sort of slightly air-conditioned, so I sort of got a waft of air-conditioning. But when I sort of thought about what I wanted to write, I wanted to write that. You know, I was really excited to go to this restaurant because we've not been out. And it's a delicious restaurant. And, you know, the first sip of drink. And so I suppose when I write, that, that's the thing that I would like to read. So I try and, I try and write what I, I would like to read. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a form of dreaming your way into something. But at the same time, it's, you know, a journalist, a storyteller is always on the outside. You're always the observer. So there's that strange paradox, isn't there, where you're trying to get that immersive experience. You're dreaming your way in. You're pulling your reader with you. But while standing out on the outside and observing the bigger picture. And I, the reason I, I, I say that is because that's exactly what you've done with your book. You've you say that you're telling everything that you know about the Italy that you've been observing for the last 16 years in this A to Z of pasta, this jigsaw, and the parts paint the picture, and it's your picture. That's that's such an interesting way in. It's dealing with the tiny, tiny little details, each type of pasta, but pulling out this telescope picture that you're presenting is your observation of a different country. Was that your intention? Is that how you see it? Oh, it's lovely. Well, you've put it, you've put it much better than I could. That's such a lovely, sort of hit, lo- so lovely to hear it described like that. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, w- there's, there's, there's 1,300 identified pasta shapes. Um, uh, of course, lots of those are historical and certain shapes have lots of names and we sort of know, and I say some of those are historical, but, you know, there's 1,300 identified shapes. So actually... Um, Picking 50 seemed completely preposterous in the beginning, but actually then it seemed, you know, I, I, it, it would be impossible. I mean, there is an encyclopedia of pasta, actually, a great book written by a great food historian. But, but, um, but yeah, the, the sort of 50 shapes were sort of, yes, 50, 50 sort of insights, 50 details in order put together to, to, yes, I suppose, have a picture of Italy and of pasta. And yes, and of course, my... my my picture. I mean, it was it was quite hard. This book. It was different to my first two books. It's less, it's less personal. Although there's plenty of me in it. Um, it's less sort of. It, there are stories, but it's less sort of memoir, isn't it? Much less narrative. It's it's tighter, I think. But yes, the sort of. So I feel as if you're sort of dipping into these fifty shapes to to paint a picture of a country. It was really rewarding to write. I had a great. I had a great publisher. Julia Annan was. R- was you know she had so much belief in the project and was such a sort of strong guiding ship in it um and and also just also sort of trusting me to say you know you can because there's so much to say about pasta where do you start and where do you finish and trusting yeah. and that's where the detail came back to me again and again and again I'm constantly overwhelmed by the amount of information about everything um yeah. I feel like I live in a sort of forest of thoughts none of which are very clear so having these shapes as a focus and also having a focus of each shape so for example you know the pishi was i was cooking with a woman in 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 tuscany and they reminded me of sort of snakes and my mixed pasta jar so the jar in my kitchen or one particular pasta shop having a sort of focus all the time for the shapes allowed me to again tell those little stories that i hope made a sort of bigger picture yeah absolutely and you love history anyway you've always called upon uh, you know history and you go right back to horace the latin poet uh you know to to talk about lasagna and and there's a real sense of 
depth and 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 rootedness which says so much about italian culture um you know it feels like i'm constantly talking to people and writing about how we lost our way in this country and i'm always thinking about how we could deal with all the food system issues in this country by borrowing more from the depth of of culinary culture like italian and did you find along your way in the story of pasta the real essence of why Italian culture has been so strongly embedded for so long, why every child grows up loving and appreciating and valuing food so that they we don't have the kind of food poverty and I mean culturally food poverty issues that we have in this country? What a good question. I'll try and answer it. I, yeah, I mean, I touched on things. I mean, what the thing about pasta, of course, was, and, and I was how interconnected we all are. I mean, of course, the story of pasta isn't, it, it, it is the story of Italy, but it's also the story of the world. I mean, uh, there's a, in Spaghetti, there's a great essay by the food historian Massimo Montanari, and he takes spaghetti with tomato sauce, the sort of iconic Italian dish, to sort of represent that Italian food is all about the other, you know tomatoes from the Americas and spaghetti from the Arabs, um, you know, came together on Italian soil. And absolutely that it is a t an Italian dish, but it is also an Arab and an American one. You know, it, it's, um, um, I mean, if one thing I feel I didn't do enough of, um, you know, there's so much sort of into, into sort of connecting food history. I do go back sort of 12,000 years to Metapotania, but, you know, I, I, that, I did feel a bit like, again, a bit like a GCSE essay, but I hope I touched on sort of how interconnected it all is. And, and then, yes, how it did find sort of home in Italian soil. But even then, you know, there's so much of Italian history which is sort of interconnected. So I, I think I was very aware of wanting it to feel bigger than just Italy, without taking anything away from this, this sort of extraordinary patrimony in Italy. It's all tied up. And, um, and if anything, I sort of wish I'd do more around Italian food culture. And I think it is, it is interesting. And um, I'm very conscious of sort of idealising it, um, which I don't want to do, because I think it sort of does it a disservice. I think there's lots of problems here. But I do think it was interesting to see in writing the book sort of how recent industrialization is in, in compared to the UK like it's always fascinating to to sort of go back three or four hundred years and realize that we, you know the Italians were eating the same things as the English you know there's ingredients I mean the tomatoes the aubergines the the peppers are all new new immigrants mm. you know um it was fascinating to read that probably Orecchietti was brought by the French to Puglia mm. um the whole Arab history you know the sort of intersection with sort of you know um the spice trails. Um, if anything, I, 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 I was anxious that I wasn't doing enough of that. Um, and finding enough in common as well. I and mean, I'm always wanting to sort of make connections with England and, and, and the sort of good things. That, that's why I always come back to English pubs, because I just think, you know, pubs and Italian trattorias are, are sort of... They're the brothers, aren't they? <laughs> they are, they are. I mean, you know, I think that you do it very well, actually. I think that that's what I read through it. You know, you talk about, you know, pasta being the story of the domestication of wheat. You know, civilization is about living off the land, but understanding it and making it your own. You know, you, you, you do talk about that. And that's, of course, about everyone. You know, that's where civilization started, by growing wheat and domesticating it and, and farms and society built around that. And Carolyn Steele writes about that, that brilliantly in Cytopia. But the difference between here and, and where you are is that the story was absolutely embedded in Italian culture and has always been. But we lost our way through industrialization. I mean, I know and I'm very aware of utopian idealization of, 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 of Italian cuisine, but there is that love. And I wonder how we can teach that love. If you can teach that love to a society which hasn't been, hasn't been brought up loving food in the same way. Yeah, or, or or is it also about that the love is there? Um, because I think we all share that, don't we? I mean, I think you know my experience in you, you know of the sort of of the of the sort of pleasure around food. I, I think it's universal. I think what 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 I've I've 
I'm aware of here, I really get, have to, this is where I have to sort of tell a story, so, you know, with my son, you know, see, I think, you know, there's so much ritual and, and tradition around food um, in Italy, which of course, you know, intersects a bit with nationalism, but anyway, um, <laughs> you know, the, the, it, the, those very, uh, you know, the so, the ways of eating are still very rhythmic and deeply traditional. So, um, so for example, uh, you know, where I live, you know, there's still, the, you know, there's still a sort of bread shop, um, you know, they, they, they have the sort of local bread. They have various, an ordinary bread shop. They have, you know, several breads for over Italy. And their big thing is pizza rossa and pizza bianca. They make really good ones. You know, and the, and the pizza rossa is the sort of thing the kids eat in their, at their 11 o'clock break. And my son's sort of, you know, he's been eating it. And at school, the school dining room is far from perfect. But, you know, they have, you know, they have polpette with, you know, potatoes on a Monday. And they have a sort of, they give them artichokes. The kids all spit them out. Um, you know, they, they have... They have sort of seasonal vegetables. I think there's just a lot more rhythm. They have bread always with their meal. They have fruit at the end. You know, I think there's a lot more rhythm and habits um, here that are sort of ingrained. It was very interesting looking at pasta pairings, um, you know, because, of course, there's a lot of, you know, you must pair this shape with that with that sauce and of course which is it's hilarious because you know someone will tell you something you must put this shape with that sauce and then someone it, then the next day someone will tell you the exact opposite oh no um i mean there's a, a great example is in rome they have cacio e pepe which is the sort of cheese and pepper and i suppose one of the the sort of traditional shapes is um is a tonnerelli which is a bit like fat square spaghetti spaghetti la catara and that's the shape but then the next person will say we'll serve it with spaghetti and then someone else will serve it with bucatini and then someone else will <laughs> will serve it with rigatoni and someone else will serve it with gnocchi and then someone else will put it in ravioli so actually the sort of canonical shape turns out to be quite a lot of shapes <laughs> um but i realized that so much of it is about sort of habit you know a habit that also a lot of traditional pasta dishes you know they were sort of born together so it, it, they they sort of were made together because they grew near each other and then you know a habit became a a deeply ingrained habit and then it became a tradition and then that that's just the way it is yeah so i, I think that's what it is it's it's yeah. the way it is i mean actually that you yeah. take away a lot of the thought process you don't need to think about what you're going to have for dinner uh, mm. because it's so natural to do it you put those pairings together because that's what you've always done that's what your mother did that's what your grandmother did and and so it's i think it's taking the thought out of it the anxiety out of it but that takes generations let's go through your mm. food moments um you, you're going through the a to z of pasta shapes you give us an enormous amount of information about pasta but you bring your own memories to it so for example the alphabeto in broth broth is the first recipe in the book it, it's about your early memories of chicken soup tell tell us about the alphabeto well i mean that sort of i didn't have alphabeto um in little the little pastina i mean they really are tiny alphabeto they're, they're sort of part of the pastina all those very small shapes i didn't actually i had alphabeti in a tin which i come to later <laughs> but um but yeah but that's sort of it's very it was the first shape and it's the you know it the, it's lovely. It's very traditional. It's one of the first dishes given to children. So it's just, it's a chicken broth. And so I, you know, as children grew up, growing up, we had lots and lots of chicken soup made by mum. It was a great favourite. So it was a sort of lovely, again, sort of trying to find things in common, um, you know, the t sort of similarities rather than differences. So I love that. And I do love pastina in brodo. There's, you know, I love, you know, the, um, you can, break pasta into lots of families but you know there's the sort of minestra the pasta you eat with a spoon because it's brothy and pasta shooter dry pasta the one you eat with a fork and those minestra those brothy minestras are some of my favorite and yeah, they do they do really tune into um a chicken soup which we ate lot we ate all the time growing up yeah. um i mean it is it, it's just i mean i love it i i still i mean i still love it it's my absolute sort of it's it's one of my great i think like a lot of this great comfort foods chicken soup yeah and, and a lot of cultures say that as well but if you've mm. never had chicken soup when you're ill given to you by your mum you will never associate <laughs> chicken soup with with comfort food will you it is as simple as that and i think that's going back to that routine that not thinking about it that just the natural relationship between thing that happens in your life and food that goes with it um, yeah, it, it, it's so interesting. It's so interesting. I just did, sorry interrupting you then because it's so I sort of I feel like we could talk about this forever. It was interesting what you were saying about, you know, the sort of habits, because actually I think that, you know, we because Italians have, have so much 
are so clear about these habits and these rituals and so proud of them and so de- quite rightly proud and and I would say and I don't want to speak for all English people I'll speak for myself but I think the English people we're so we're, we're often the opposite mm. but actually it's quite strange we we have just as much reason to be to be proud. it's funny only in these last few years you know when I first came to Italy I used to be quite sort of ashamed of telling people I was English around the food and I was so used to this sort of barrage of sort of silly things that people would say about English food some with sort of reason but also not with good reason you know I had lovely things growing Mm. up and and for me you know homemade chicken soup but sort of fish finger and peas Mm. is just as important and just as valid and just as comforting and just as much of a favorite here in Italy you know frozen peas rule um you know so actually it is about our own isn't it our own sense of confidence in our own food and I certainly haven't had the confidence that certainly my Italian friends would show yeah um around it so it is it, it, it that's a sort of interesting yeah anyway uh, I, I think it is it, the ritual is key I really do I think it's taking the, th- the thought out of it and putting the love in in fact you make a, a a comment about the food writing advice you give knowing when to write from your head and when to write from your stomach and I think it's that there's something there the, the head is the observation the taking yourself out of it a little bit to be able to give it form and 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 substance but the the stomach is the the gut feeling isn't it and i think that ritual that we're talking about is all about your stomach yeah and i mean you, and, and yeah and, 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 and hunger and wanting you know we and that's why we have i mean i read lots in english and i read lots of in italian but i mean you know that's why i'm thinking of people like you know nigel slater or or simon hopkinson or ruby tando or you know rebecca may johnson or or sort of mira you know these people who nigella laws you know i mean all all these wonderful english writers who so are so able to write about the that sort of primitive appetite and hunger and longing and i'm making it sound much more wanky than they do but you know really it's really wonderful i mean we have su- you know we have such brilliant food writing in england and and i think you're absolutely right and i love like you do to to read about food i just you know i spent my teenage years absolutely immersed in food writing as did you um but the, the your macaroni cheese again early memories of family food yeah yes um, but bringing your new world together with that, it, 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 tell us about your macaroni. Cheese. Well, it's interesting. I mean, that, a macaroni was was a re, is an interesting shape to was to look at sort of historically. Again, I, you know, I didn't, it, you know, it, it, this, I try and touch on the sort of scholarly aspects of pasta, but you know, it's it, macaroni is really important because it was a sort of it was one of the early shapes, um, and macaroni was many things. Um, uh, I mean, I always knew it growing up as the sort of small, slightly curved tubes in cheese sauce macaroni cheese which is also you know is you know is also a dish here although it might be made with another shape um as i say in the south macaroni is is the name for many many um shapes it was the sort of generic name for pasta along with vermicelli along with gnocchi so it was a nice chapter to sort of look at these big histories and then look at sort of remembering my childhood um Again, um, you know, again, being sort of slightly embarrassed when I got to Italy that the only pasta shapes I really knew were spaghetti macaroni, you know, spaghetti hoops and alfabetti and farfalle and all these. <laughs> but actually, it's a, much, it's a love shape here. Um, and um, and in, the, in the South, so Vincenzo's family, even though the macaroni, they might say macaroni, but they could well be using rigatoni or, or, or sort of mezzemanica or another sort of tubular shape and then baked into a, a sort of big jumbly huge messy um you know pasta al forno and i love all i mean i love those recipes because they're so um sort of accommodating Uh, you know you can sort of put anything in them and i think one of the recipes i've got macaroni cheese or macaroni al gratin in in italy so with bechamel and whatever cheese you want but then also there's a nice recipe for a sort of very southern italian um big baked pasta so tomato and aubergine and meatballs and if you want to go really sicilian you know hard boiled eggs peas (laughs) paper clips you know i mean it's really it's a great great big one of these big messy um sort of you know generous dishes that I like so that was a nice chapter to write you know I feel I you know 500 words about this big history and then this little contained dish yeah absolutely lovely and because that's what it all comes down to you can write and write and write about the ingredients but ultimately you've got to sit down and eat them and share them with the family 
because that's what it's about. The maltagliati is your third food moment. This is based on leftovers. This is the waste mm. bits, isn't yeah. it? So, could, well, yeah, it, perfect. It is traditionally made in um, the sort of badly cut bits. So the sort of off cuts, the sort of scraps and that will be leftovers. Actually, now maltagliati is sort of also made intentionally. But yes, it's the sort of badly cut scraps of traditionally egg and flour pasta or flour and water pasta that then would be um, that then would be either used fresh or dried. Um, very resourceful. I think it is interesting, again, sort of touching on that idea of, you know, it, it's um, Italians are very resourceful with cooking um, and they're very proud of being very resourceful. Again, they sort of have a, a language for it, this whole language of avancy and leftovers and resourcefulness. I mean, again, not always wanting to sort of defend England, but we do in England too. We have just the most wonderful dishes for leftovers, yeah. um, but we just don't have the same language for it and we don't have the same pride around the language for it. So where, you know, so it, it's sort of interesting and it was interesting to sort of look at, you know, I don't know where, where sort of bread would be, you know, leftover bread would be, you know, used in a soup or baked into bread and butter pudding or, you know, sort of fried in a frying pan with egg. Um, but yes, the, 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 around the pasta, I love those shapes. And I also, um, you know, I, I, um, I approached pasta making in the book. I'm a sort of enthusiastic amateur. I didn't want it to be. There's so many wonderful books about pasta and there's so many wonderful books about very skilled pasta making and there's the wonderful pasta grannies so I was very clear that I wanted it to be sort of a um that everyone wouldn't feel intimidated that it would just be a pretty sort of basic there'd be a basic recipe um to make these sheets that you could make many shapes from and that the most fun would be the sort of scraggy leftover bits that you would put in a thick chickpea soup yeah well I love the fact that you said that you felt intimidated about making pasta yourself that as a child your mother used to just let you play with flour and water and you used to play with it like plasticine but you didn't then touch pasta for a very long time because you felt that it was there was it was a little bit beyond you and I have to say I share that yeah I did I did and but actually that was the other thing and I loved Juliet for that you know my publisher we, we were very keen that we didn't divide the book into fresh and dried and you know and make your own pasta and buy your pasta and and um that it was just the shapes because of course they're also into into sort of into sort of connected anyway. I mean, so many, everything starts off fresh and lots of dried shapes are fresh and you can buy most shapes. And I love the idea that, you know, what do you fancy? Do you want to make your lasagna? Great. Do you want to buy your lasagna? Great. It was all just the same. There was no sort of value judgment on all these wonderful things. But um, yeah, and I mean, making pasta, I, I have, I do really enjoy it. I don't do it that often because I, some people say, oh, you can sort of, I mean, I can make ravioli pretty quickly. I never, <laughs> I never find... I'd rather have a bit of toast. You know, it's, it is sort of a big mess in the kitchen, but I sometimes like that. And I say I have overcome and I, and I think I'm sort of pleased, thanks to friends, about the sort of recipes, how they've worked out. I hope it does um, help encourage people to remember that it is just what we did when we were kids. You know, it's a mountain of flour, make it into a volcano, four eggs in the middle, get it into a ball, doesn't matter how you do it, like whatever works, knead it, again, whatever works, it starts off scraggy, it ends up feeling like a baby's bottom, roll it out, however works, you know, I think, you know, that's the sort of, that, <laughs> rip it into whatever shape you want, you know, I hope that that's the sort of spirit of the book. Yes, absolutely, <laughs> that is so liberating. Um, your final food moment is the vermicelli alla vongole, your favourite, uh, both in life and in the book, you say, um, it's probably one of the most popular um, of Italian recipes, um, alla vongole, I would say. Um, why for you? You write about it so beautifully. It's a shared love dish, isn't it? It was, uh, I mean, it's so delicious. Um, um, it, of course, I put it with vermicelli because, um, because that was a good way to write about the vermicelli. Very important shape. Um, again, sort of one of the um, like pasta, in, for example, spaghetti is such a late word. I mean, vermicelli was, the pasta wakers were the vermicellari. So it was a nice opportunity to write about that shape. And then just that, um, you know, that delicious combination makes me think of summer holidays, makes me think of, you know, th th there's a nice local restaurant in Fregeni where we go and we eat fried fish and then spaghetti alla vongole on the beach with sort of sandy feet and, you know, licking our arms because they taste salty. <laughs> it makes me think of that. But also at home, yes, I do like it. And I think it's, and I, and I, and again, I want I want this to be a sort of book, you know, I, I want this to be a book about sort of shared, a shared love. I know that, you know, for a lot of people, it's a favourite pasta dish. So it was a sort of, that feels like a nice thing too. I mean, I, I, it is my favourite. Um, it's my favourite, I think, 
favourite of many favourites, I'll say. <laughs> it's it's interesting, though. It The way you describe it feels like you're very, very much embedded. You are now, you know, almost Italian. Vermicelli, as you just mentioned very briefly, is was the original. It's a very, very old Italian pasta and spaghetti, not so. Um, and perhaps spaghetti alla vongole is what we would necessarily um, associate with, with the dish. Choosing vermicelli feels like you're choosing the deeper, the older, the the original. Was that even slightly deliberate? Well, actually, that's a really good point. And actually, I'm aware of that. And I wasn't trying to be sort of clever. I mean, it was obviously the book was about matching recipes to um, to shapes. And there was a certain amount of jigging around because, you know, and there was a little bit of sort of shoehorning things. I wanted to find groups. I mean, we decided that spaghetti would be all tomato. Um, and um, and so and but also so it wasn't trying to be sort of clever. I say vermicelli is the really the sort of ev- it, the the sort of evolving of of the sort of dried pasta strings which began in Sicily with the Arabs. It really was you know the Arabs and that sort of fascinating history. And then it sort of moved up with the sort of merchant ships and you know Genova and Naples were very important centres of, of pasta making. And you know vermicelli little worms, um, these strings of pasta. And um, there were various words, but it what it was a, so I sort of chose it. I chose it because we needed to put. I mean, actually, I've put vongole and clams and puttanesca um, in with vermicelli. So it wasn't trying to be clever. I mean, obviously, it was a good way to highlight the importance of vermicelli as a shape. I mean, vermicelli was spaghetti. You know, that they're, they're um, now they've become sort of different shapes. So, um, yeah. but that was a bit of sort of shoehorning. And I wanted to sort of. Um, there's a really beautiful church near us. Um, um, called Santa Maria del Orto and in it is the chapel of the Vermicellari and it, from the 1600s and that was the sort of guild of the pasta makers so I got to write about that church um, you know and the sort of importance of the word uh, the, the word as the, these, the pasta makers sort of historically um, I hope people don't feel I've sort of shoot, you know I'm sort of forcing the history I hope it sits comfortably in the book I was aware that some bits felt a bit uncomfortable you know oh, no no not at all for, for me it feels like a beautiful end to to the book it feels like a, a real sort of circular movement to kind of coming back to where it all started from and very deeply very deeply present in Italy um and and it's interesting that you just mentioned about that lovely church you do all sorts of wonderful things in Rome you you give guided tours with a with a historian you you teach food writing you I mean I loved uh, just tell me about the market table feasting that you do in Testaccio oh that's lovely yeah that's which I'm missing hugely it's sort of nice you've mentioned that because we can mention Carla Tomasi so a really one of my teachers is um, Carla who meeting Carla was along with my Australian friend Alice was an important day because Carla you know is a wonderful Roman cook and chef who spent many years in London. So when I first met Carla, Carla didn't want to talk about ravioli. Carla wants to talk about sort of, you know, the Arg Mary Berry and uh, where to get the best pita bread. You know, she's truly a, she's sort of so undogmatic about, about you know, she just loves food and, and you know, with this sort of big, expansive love of food, enthusiastic, funny, irreverent. So we, we became friends and she was sort of, she was, became a sort of great guide. And then, yeah, and then we began doing these occasional um, cooking lessons together, which was just, it was such a, it was such a, um, a, you know, we'd have small groups and we would go to the market and then we'd all cook together. Um, And uh, it was a lovely opportunity to sort of work and then work with Carla, you know, for her to be, you know, for her to be working with her. And then it seemed like sort of bringing the recipes that I was writing about to life. um, in So that was really good fun and very rewarding and... um, and uh you know the, the companionable and great for my writing actually i miss it a lot because it was um it was a sort of lovely dimension i don't think i, I wouldn't have written the pasta but were it not for carla because she um you know she we really put the also we just got to make things a lot yeah you know you, i got to make things again and again and again so and that's really thanks to her and she sort of gave me the confidence um she fresh pasta um i think you'd like carla she's yeah. a, she's she's wonderful she's really wonderful um <laughs> And, Will you do uh, that again when when you can? Yeah, that will. Yes, I hope we do. Ro- Rome's opening up again. I mean, yeah. I, it, it's um, we can travel again. God, I mean, I can't wait. I, I mean, I miss the I miss England. It it sort of hurts. <laughs> I really. When you know, were I you ha- last here? 
a year and like last March? Well, I mean, we, none of us have moved. Um, yeah. We're all imagining where we would like to go. I stopped flying two years ago. Um, so my thing is to get on a train and, and explore Europe properly, taking the time and to really immerse myself. So I'm fascinated by your market table, but also your food and architecture tours. And I think that that's the kind of deeper experience, the real connection that I hope that people will want when they get out of Britain again. What's life really all about? Tell us about the food and architecture tours. So similar. It, so that's with Agnes Crawford, who's an, agri, um, an architectural historian. And similar. I mean, we sort of, you know, our work, our work sort of intersected. I would often ask Agnes for sort of advice, along with lots of other people um, as well. Uh, so she would... and. Um, and so, yes, sort of fans of each other as work. And I say she was a she was a great sort of she's knowledgeable and um, and 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 fun. And so the sort of our conversations that would be helping me with an article for a newspaper sort of evolved into these these tours, which have been interesting because we've done them on Zoom. And of course, that's been quite a sort of interesting dimension, hasn't it? Yeah, How Zoom has been an interesting it, you know, in fact, my mum and dad did one of our walking tours and, you know, they're they're at home with a sort of glass of, you know of like you know something nice to drink and they were saying you know agnes is like the sort of david attenborough sort of you know because of course agnes is on zoom she's a very good tour guide i always feel a little bit like her comedy sidekick sort of intersecting about olives but she you know of course the zoom has a slightly fish eye sort of perspective so actually you're almost closer than you than you would be even if you're with agnes that's yeah. not to say that you know that the sort the sort of you know that we don't if people want to come back but i suppose also for maybe for 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 much older um, people who are wondering how and when they'll travel, that actually the idea of that sort of, I don't want to say armchair travel, because that sounds so sort of, doesn't sound very nice. And I think the idea, you know, I think what we can do on Zoom is sort of, is wonderful, isn't it? it, it I think you can get closer on Zoom. In many ways, you can get, you, you, you're in my home and I'm in your home. I'm, exactly, I'm I can say that now, yeah. I think that's really quite wonderful. And I think that'll open up a lot of opportunities for people, um, as you say, who, who might not necessarily want to put up with the, the heat of Rome, but be fascinated by the history and the stories and, and relive their 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 trips to, to Rome in the past. Um, are those still available? Can, can people join you? I'd love yeah. to join you. Yes, they do it. Actually, we've done some food ones. Yes, they are. And they're, and they will, and they're, 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 they're still sort of on Zoom. They're quite occasional. I don't do, you know, that many tours because you know there's so many wonderful tour guides doing great things but yes they are and then we will hopefully make those live again that the new thing is that we've decided we the walks are sort of ingredient centric again that idea that we were saying before you know that if you focus on one thing if you focus on you know i don't know salt it, it, you know it's like i've got a friend of mine who comes to rome often and he always sort of comes to look at one artist or or sort of like or or go to the cinema it was his favorite year you know he just came and he his main objective was going to seeing films in different Italian cinemas or, you yeah. know, and, yeah. and actually it's sort of, isn't it? It's having a focus. So you sort of get this nice percent by focusing on one detail, yes. you get then this sort of lovely big picture. So we do that with, um, with ingredients. Um, and and nice. if people do want to find out about it, they go to Rachel Eats. Yes. Yes. I'm saying that very confidently being, <laughs> <laughs> being updated, <laughs> being updated. But, you know, it is. Um, but yes, for now on Zoom, it is amazing. I mean, it, it, there's, there's something very intimate about it. You've been immersed in this world for a long time. It, yeah. But podcasts, it's been they've sort of they're just thriving. It feels just the most wonderful medium. It is an absolutely fantastic opportunity. I mean, I've been all over the world uh, in the last year and a half while sitting in this orange chair. And I have been treated to so many wonderful experiences. You know, Bill Buford's extraordinary immersive experience, learning to be a French cook in Lyon. Dan Barber in upstate New York. I mean, yeah, I can go anywhere. You yeah. in Italy on a on a Monday morning. How glorious is that? It, it is riches. Yeah. And like you say, intimate. It is. It was interesting. I think my mum and dad again. That sort of summed it up. The fact that they, very much, with the, it's the same about the proximity mm. of the voice. I think mm. and mm. the eyes. So yes, I think. I think we live. I feel as if it's it's another dimension. Yeah. Um, which I really like, and I hope that it feels enriching, and that we can have sort of more dimensions, which only feels a good thing. Thanks for listening. You can also find me on Food FM, the online radio station and global podcast platform which aims to change the world through food. And do get in touch on social media. I'm at Cooking the Books with Jilly Smith on Instagram and at Jilly Smith on Twitter. 
And you can sign up for my newsletter at jillysmith.com to find out about the Cooking the Book Supper Club at my house in East Sussex. I'll be back next week with the next on the Andre Simon Award shortlist, Yasmin Khan, who'll be talking about her extraordinarily beautiful book, Ripe Figs. <laughs>